Oh yeah, Alan. Already. Link there. Go ahead. It's time to lay down a few reactionary comments to Evo's latest video there, and it's this is all about Tesla and electrostatics. So off the top, he begins in reference to a what he calls a disruptive discharge of a capacitor, which produces a current impulse. And um, <clears throat> he notes that his previous experiment, like the, the last video that he put out last year, did not produce, quote, power. And back then I reviewed his work and pointed out a reason or two for his less than positive result. Primarily the issue for me resolved around his lack of recognition in terms of the resonant process and the proper choices regarding the magnitudes uh, he chose of both the inductive and the capacitive values of the parts he used in the design. Um, and you'll know what I mean if you've read my previous stuff on that. <clears throat> not, <clears throat> not that important to cover that again here, but he cites a change in impedance of the circuit itself, which um, produced a drop in current that he was hoping to get out of the ground in, in a pseudo-resonant function. And I say pseudo um, out, of what I, out of regard for what I just laid down on how he had little regard for uh, orders of magnitude and the size of his parts. So at the outset of this video, he begins with history and Tesla's narration of his own experiments, and he cites Tesla's mention of infinite energy stored up in the universe. And he quotes his assertion that the ether is the eternal recipient and transmitter of this infinite energy. Okay, well, since Tesla's era, we've come a long way in regard to identification of the mechanics and the operation of objects which interact with what we more currently call counter space. And that is a term frequently used by Eric Dollard inclusively. And when it comes to this type of energy dynamic, I do think that some distinction needs to be drawn between what we call ether, the medium by which light propagates, and counter space, a dimensional modality where energy is stored, quote, and from where it is also released via a process like, like electromagnetic induction, for example. I'm just checking my mic level as we go because Discord is constantly turning me down. Um, <clears throat> so he then mentions that he's going to skip everything Tesla itemized about lightning in particular. And I think he, this, is an, this is a mistaken judgment because the viewer does need to be aware of some of the ins and outs of that particular mechanism in order to get a better grasp on what is to come in this video that we're watching here. And I think I've mentioned a lot of it in the Friday night spaces that Sacred holds in the past couple. Um, lastly, I think to Lily Hanna, if I recall. But anyways, uh, Evo then in this video focuses on his assertion that one can electrostatically charge a conductor by applying a high voltage to it. And thinking this through, the conductor would not then be thought of as a conductor per se, but more like a single turn inductor, like a, like a one loop coil, so to speak. And that agrees with natural circuit geometry because you're always going from positive to negative through the actual stuff in the circuit. And that is essentially a loop that you're creating around your power source. So when putting this into diagrammatic form, this is where the difficulty in analysis of Evo's work begins. The, uh, the next phase of action after charging the conductor, so to speak, is to discharge that high voltage value to ground via a spark gap, and that's what Tesla is all about. Uh, the total amount of energy involved in such a setup is limited only by two factors the number of turns in the inductor, one in this case, and the length of that single loop. Uh, this leads us to fundamentally agree with Tesla's comparison of electromagnetic inductive energy and electrostatic energy buildup in a given circuit. So, when looking at any such design, like the ones Tesla has in mind, Evo has in mind. This is um, quite visually obvious. There's, there's nowhere to put it, so to speak. Like, wh where is the induction happening in terms of the geometry of what you've created? There, there isn't anywhere. When I, um, 
when I introduce people to the right hand rule and the, the how to produce a bee field with a coil and everybody holds out their hand and they picture the current going through their fingers and the bee field polarity coming out their thumb. Um, it's really about the geometry between those items, between your curled up fingers and your thumb pointing out the end. It's that space right in the middle, that axial point inside the coil. This is the, the threshold, so to speak, between space and counter space and where to put it. And hopefully that will become a little more clear as I keep reading here. So in the video at six minutes and 15 seconds, I hear him talking about a back EMF spike coming from a coil, just like I've discussed many times, and how he expects the current in the circuit to reverse polarity for the duration of the spike and then to revert to original polarity. And he asserts that Tesla says it won't work that way. Well, in explanation of that, insert that assertion, he then reads, reads off the paper how Tesla wasn't tremendously successful in his attempts to capture that spike at 20 kilohertz switching speeds with a simple Leyden jar. If you guys know how those are constructed, um, its dielectric installation would break down and allow arcing, and which is why I um, recommended people get up to speed regarding lightning in general, because this effect is involved. And it's something that brings the voltage of the jar instantly back down to near zero. And use of vacuum as the dielectric is the choice Tesla made to deal with that problem inside the Leyden jar. And that's when we're talking about building tubes and, and working the geometry of the problem in a different way. So in the video, when we get to 10 minutes, he finally gets to the fundamental point of difference between electromagnetic current flow and electrostatic flow. The former operates through a rigid conduit, like a copper wire. The latter will jump through air or even a vacuum. And they are different mechanical processes. And we necessarily observe that difference due to the single fact that the physical conductor has a much higher impedance value, reluctance to pass current, ironically enough, than does a non-physical one, like vacuum. Uh, this one parameter tells us all we need to know about which one is best suited for the electrostatic production of light, since mostly visible light is also a very high frequency type of propagation. The part which seems to be evading Evo here is evading his notice, rather, is the non highlighted part of the text at 11 minutes in the video in the left column. And it says electrostatic effects are in many ways, let me get that type in my own text, in many ways available for the production of light. Add to this the next postulation regarding rapidly alternating potential. This is, to me, a striking difference in the methods used, Evo versus Tesla. Evo is constantly using pulsed DC. However, the phrase alternating potential to me suggests an AC method of voltage manipulation, not merely relying on the decay of the B field in the coil at the off switching point to produce an electrical pulse in the opposite polarity. I think those are entirely different animals. So he then points out that it is desirable to increase both voltage as well as frequency as far as practicable. In turn, this is where we should depart from the use of coils in pulse production. But um, he appears not to see this requisite. And I think it, it's part of what is leading to his general confusion and lack of success in his endeavors in this video. So at around 13 minutes, he seems to be unable to identify the two methods of light production at work here. The one he does focus on is the electrostatic production. As energy jumps in all directions in a radial fashion from the electrode to the glass outer sphere, looking for a ground plane through which to resolve. The one he does not look at is the black body radiation coming from the heat produced in a heated filament, you know, a resistive coil inside a vacuumed out tube. <clears throat> so when we get to 14 minutes, he shows 
a more non-highlighted text in the left column. And there at the start, Tesla mentions use of 9,000 volts at 20 kilohertz and cites bulbs which can be used at this level with broken filaments inside the bulbs. This is because at this level, it is no longer the same mechanism at work. It goes from the latter to the former. The text where this is confirmed is also non-highlighted on the left in mention of figure 120, which is precisely what I just described. At the same place in the text, he cites use of coatings. And I take this to mean that he has coated the bulb's glass with something remotely conductive, which serves to complete the electrostatic path to ground, which is actually a loop in the case of this setup. Let me check my mic. How am I doing here? Uh, not so good. Are you doing Somebody great. say something there? Uh, uh, yes, hot mic a little bit. Hey, Robert, how are we doing? Glad you can make it. So um, we covered it 14 minutes and that, you know, that the second one is no longer the one that's at the mechanism at work. It's the, it's the former one that is, and that we, we cite that at figure 120. And at the same place, we're talking about this coding. And in turn, he also sets up a zone of capacitance in the act of doing that in the very thickness of glass, which separates the two coatings inside of the bulb, outside of the bulb. And Tesla's mechanism of choice, in this case, involves capacitive discharge, not discharge from a coil. Two different animals, if you will. He's using a very high voltage rated, small capacity vehicle, condenser, capacitor. This is something which will indeed work at a much higher frequency than any coil, simply out of the fact that it takes time to induce current in a coil, where capacitors, as he shows in his oscilloscope shots in previous videos, and even the beginning of this one, can charge and discharge comparatively quickly to a coil. And by the time we get to 1745 in the video, Evo states his main goal, and that is the production of electric power, not light, which is what Tesla has been talking about this whole time. His next selection of text, addresses the production of light using a rapidly alternating electrostatic field. And he states that this is not a normal form of resonance. What I think he means is that this doesn't resemble the resonance we see, for example, echoing in a coil immediately after the cessation of emission of a back EMF spike in a decaying B-field scenario. It's a bit strange that he should mention it not until this point in the analysis. Um, an AC setup is indeed entirely a, a, a different scenario than the one he's focused on. So we get to 21 minutes. He shows another page of text starting in the top left, citing that the apparatus must function at extremely high frequency in order to permit the use of not so extremely high voltage. But it is the reason he gives with which I disagree. Um, he states that he interprets Tesla's need for high frequency over high voltage is so that then we can keep the potential a little bit more down. I think there's a great deal about his assertion which he's not considering. This is where I end my review of his video out of regard for the sequential and progressive nature of his presentation, building additional premises on incorrectly built original premises. So before I draw out my reasoning for why I disagree with the reason he gives for high frequency as a requisite, I think I'd better take us back um, to the drawing board here with respect to nomenclature used at the start and then add some to the scenario. Um, I see endless conflation between the thing we call ether and the infrequently mentioned phenomenon of counter space. This is something where Eric Dollard, as I have mentioned many times, excels at providing a definition. Uh, but first, <clears throat> let's, play with, let's play with ether for a second here. Evo mentions that <clears throat> unlimited amounts of energy reside in the ether, so to speak. And I think this is... A, this is incorrect modeling. I don't, I don't know exactly how to, how to put it. But again, I think 
is, is what I want to point out here, that if you, you disagree, that's also fine. But right now we're talking about what I think. So here, here we go if you, if you got a, a spoon that big. To me, ether is a force, which is indeed electrostatic in nature. I do attribute the motion of large bodies of air across Earth to this force. We demonstrably live inside an electrostatic gradient which resembles the geometry of a generally flat pair of Gaussian surfaces, one of which being the very ground upon which we live. And the etheric force, which exists as a result of that, is the thing which constantly acts on something like a large air mass, which is diamagnetic, diamagnetic, let me get that right, due to its moisture content. Since we also live within a magnetic field, I see where the two will constantly interact according to the nature of the summed geometry of the two. We often speak of the toroidal nature of the subtle forces overhead. So consider how those lines of force will meet up at different angles with air at different altitudes. And you can see how winds will be propelled in various directions across the earth at the same time. Cyclic variations, as small as they may actually be, in the specific local shapes of those lines of force will provide an equally cyclic variation in phenomena such as the thing we call the jet stream. The ether force in this analysis seems to have a type of polarity to it, Something which we notice in the, air, the arena, rather, of the interferometer. I see this polarity as the influence behind our conclusions regarding the anisotropy of the propagation of light itself. Counterspace, however, is an entirely different phenomenon in my world. This is something which I have on other occasions described as part of the real explanation regarding the mechanics of electromagnetic induction and electrostatic capacitance. The thing which drives actions inside coils and capacitors and the like. This is the realm people address when they speak of parts of physics which focus on action at a distance, for example. In attempts to define it, I've referred to counterspace as where to put it. When we talk about a coil's typical production of a B field, an electromagnetic field perpendicular to the current flow through its loops of conductor. This is the place to which we allude when we talk about the infinite energy available to us. If only we could figure out how to make use of it. So <clears throat> in more intricate descriptions, I will invoke an additional set of three dimensions on top of the four, on top of the four we enjoy in current physical space, to which that current sourced force will essentially open the door and inject counter space with its electrical energy. Ironically, I see this mechanical non-physical process as similar to how a capacitor will store voltage as it is charged. You, you continue to try and use additional current to inject more energy into it as if it were a conductor, yet without an increase in voltage applied to it, its stored energy, what we call Q, its stored energy amount over time will not increase. <coughs> that capacitors, they fill up, and then that's kind of all there is in total of what you can get out of it after the fact. <clears throat> now, in both cases, we can see how the slope of the falling edge will always be far steeper than the rising edge, <clears throat> since the return path of the energy is backed at a place referred to as the zero point, you know, in dimensionally speaking, by near infinite voltage. This we see evidenced in the shape of the back EMF spike, which comes out of the coil as the B field decays. The same relation exists with the capacitor in that the stored potential will be pushed out of the cap as voltage applied is cut and or a path to ground is provided to the capacitor. <clears throat> Only impedances on the physical side will affect flow rate. 
So back to the video briefly, I see Tesla's use of high frequency AC to be pointing at an unquantified rate of interaction with counter space. This is also a place where I'd like to make a clarification about what Evo said regarding what happens in an AC scenario. <clears throat> I don't see what happens along a conductor during application of pulse DC in a coil setup versus an actual alternating current mechanism as being the same thing like Evo kind of does appear to do here. He mentions current reversal in the event of a back EMF spike coming out of a coil. The issue is that it isn't an electromotive force per se. It's an electrostatic one. Therefore, it doesn't offer the ability to do work in a way similar to how the latter does. This is something which appears to not yet really have occurred to Evo, and that's why he's trying to produce usable electromotive power from electrostatic processes. Secondly, in an AC setup, Evo states that in the second electrical motion, as in when you reverse the polarity, we apply, quote, negative voltage, and then come back to ground. To me, this sounds like a voltage geometry entirely different than application of voltage in the opposite direction. This may seem like a semantic until one looks at the difference in the two in schematic form relative to what the parts on the board see from the power source. But I'll, I'll leave that alone for uh, the purpose of the rest of this uh, analysis that's a kind of a in the weeds concept mm, back to the rate like to come, i would like to come back to that at some point someday sure no absolutely when i have more time to draw a couple schematics for you you'll it'll become plain as day i think but um let's get back to the rate of interaction with counter space i think this is a, a kind of a key concept that really is under discussed similarly to how we measure the difference difference is plural and the speed of propagation of light. I think we need to start to measure the rates of interaction with counter space itself and set up resonant function according to those measured orders of magnitude, both voltage as well as frequency. I think this is what Tesla was driving at without actually putting his finger on it and naming names. He was letting the crowd know the direction he was going, but he wasn't giving them the map only some landmarks to ex expect to see along the way. It's about hitting physical space with bi-directional electrical motion at a rate which is resonant with the rate of interaction with counter space in the production of light. And by this time, <clears throat> by this time, I do hope that you can see how we must take into account the anisotropic nature of our interaction with counter space. In the same way that Evo is seeming not to notice the resonant function of the coil's performance immediately after the decay of an EMF spike, as well as the model of alternating current generation, he seems to have missed how, Hes how Tesla's designs only use coils as a part of his voltage source and not part of the mechanistic design. At 22 and a half minutes into the vid, he shows Tesla's image of a typical electrostatic setup. Well, he does show part of the setup. At the bottom, we only really see the secondary coil of the step-up transformer in supply of the high voltage. We see neither the primary coil, nor anything to do with switching, nor input polarities. Outward, we see the secondary connected to a capacitor, then to a spark gap, then a pair of bulbs mounted on a U, thusly closing the circuit by looping everything after the gap. So think of the U as a form of current limitation for a given impulse. In an inverted sense, the spark gap keeps the voltage hitting the U at a minimum voltage. So one is an upper limiter of current, and the other one is a lower limiter of voltage, so to speak. What we also don't see is any kind of magnetic quenching of the spark gap itself, something 
Tesla is also famous for using, and I agree with his choice based on personal experience. He wants the rising edge to be just as steep as the falling edge of each impulse coming from the cap. Although a minor point, I note that he speaks of using capacitors in series, yet he shows no such thing in this diagram. I also find it interesting that he shows more distance in the spark gap than he does the capacitor spacing. I think these were deliberate decisions in order to keep those who are not skilled in the art from privately commercializing and benefiting from his work. That's life in the patent world, hey guys? So in the end, I do hope that all of this ranting uh, somewhat helps you guys in your analysis of Evo's work. And uh, you got any questions about this time, uh, now would be the time. Don't, should have been a teacher? Dude, that was Can we give you a professor degree or? <laughs> <laughs> that was a great well, I, I was a teacher, but I, I taught music. <laughs> I really like the distinctions that you drew with the ether as a physical material media necessary for electromagnetic propagation versus the idea of where to, where do we put the energy stored? Where does energy come from? Where does it go? What does it mean to like be in equilibrium with that state and like drawing that uh, distinction between, you know, yeah, what's it, what's the word you use counter space and, you know, and differentiating that from the ether. Was, yeah. Dude, that yeah. was, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Is that, cause that, that's kind of how I see it too. That's, and I that's see the word, I was gonna say, I, I think I see like a lot of people that like don't know that like th that distinction like is available. They're just like, oh yeah, ether. It comes from there. It comes from there. It goes in there. It's like, well, it's not really what you know how how it's what's how it's behaving, right? As like a mechanism that we're that's yeah. being used. But yeah, I think ether is all happening in our four physical dimensions, and it is the exchange with the additional three dimensions. I think is. Is the thing that's missing from the analysis in a lot of uh, people's work. And Eric does love to use the word counter space. I, I love it every time he does, because every, every time he does, he brings more attention to it. And um, then we can see the reaction in a more structured way and, and relate to what we actually see on the scope when we do these setups and we see what's coming down the pipe. Yeah, it was really illuminating stone. I really illuminating unfortunately i had not yet had the time to actually give evo's video a meaningful uh go through yet so now i'm definitely gonna have to do that well fortunately now you got a recording of the review so you can, you can <laughs> right. jump in the wayback machine and you're good and hey, I, we oh. lost robert there too and I, I did tag evo i uh, with this video and i linked back to his, <laughs> his discussion on this so, you know, maybe off chance we've opened a dialogue up here. So, Evo, if you do happen to see okay. this video, there are multiple ways to reach Stone. You can respond right here in the comments if you want. But also, Stone, if you want to tell them how to reach you on Telegram. Yeah, that would probably be the most um, efficient way. Is On Telegram, I'm, I'm just at Man of Stone. All one word. Pretty easy there to hit. Go. So, yeah. Um, had a secondary thought there. Would be uh, would be awesome to see a dialogue open up with that. As far as I can tell, Evo seems pretty um, into the idea of open discussion and open research. So, uh, yeah, yeah, he does. It feels good, yeah, to hear him speak of it that way too. It's great, and yep. I, uh, it, it rings with me when he mentions that um, he's been banging at this for eight years. Um, I I feel for the guy, but for me, it's been just a little more than triple that. <laughs> looking at this and what to do on and on you know really it's for me it's been since the turn of the century that i've been looking at this back emf thing and now this electrostatic thing and now this counter space thing and trying to to rub the beans together you know and see if we can create a big stock of some kind yeah it's funny you mentioned that his about his origins because i found him his, his channel i uh, looking up steinmetz stuff on youtube and I came across his like oldest first videos of him just recording himself reading Charles Proteus Steinmetz. Uh, and I was like, well, that's funny. This is almost kind of along the lines of what, you know, we've done a lot. <laughs> and I was like, what are what this guy's up to now? And I go and click and he's like pumping energy from the ground, free energy. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, evolution. <laughs> so, yeah, um, 
I seem because there's uh, probably a little bit of overlap in interest there. But yeah, uh, I mean, I would also still be interested in revisiting his earlier work and dealing with it from a perspective more attuned to resonant function, something a little more conducive, pun intended. <laughs> and uh, just see where we can get trying to get energy to jump out of the ground like that. You know, that would be fortuitous. Mm, indeed. I think um, in terms of the mechanics now and then, um, I, I, there's got to be, in my opinion, some observation of the difference. And these days, it's all about the semiconductor. Switching frequencies for us are are effortless. We just buy the right chip that'll freak, you know, that'll change. 20 kilohertz is not even like breaking a sweat these days in terms of silicon-based architecture. We're into the gigahertz of switching now. Like several, several orders of magnitude faster in switching effortlessly. But I think something is lost there in making a technological difference like that. Back then, it was all about brushed commutation. And if you guys haven't looked into that much, I strongly recommend it in terms of everything they did from the dynamo forward. Um, it's always about the making and the breaking of the contact between the wheel and the brushes of the thing that's spinning to produce Yo, the electrical flow the chat, out. What's it called? I said brushed commutation brushed commutation thank I can, you yeah let me just Wait. yes that's exactly right and and the part is actually called a brushed commutator that's that's the part of the system that you know you have um carbon or something like that as a contact point instead of something harder like titanium something that's gonna um, create less wear on the rotor copper surfaces where current is you know connecting to the outside world um yeah there's there's a tremendous electrical dynamic there in in terms of making and breaking the connection constantly as the wheel spins every on every off is this brutal electrical moment on the microscopic scale and it is the same arena where when I talk to people about um, creating electrical circuits on the on the breadboard, that you should solder as many connections as you can to reduce the amount of work the actual circuit material, physical material in the circuit has to do to maintain to maintain current flow, so to speak. I hope that makes sense. That the more times you use an alligator clip to connect one thing to another, for example, are the more times you've created this vast chasm of dirty space between one part of the conductor and another part of the conductor where electrons, quote, must flow in the resolution of charge, in the flow of current. And it's, it's part of what screws up people's plans to operate switchable things at low voltage for example, because that in terms of a ratio becomes far more significant in terms of things that can interfere with effective switching. So uh, I don't know, that's kind of an intangible for most people because of lack of experience in creating circuits in general. But if you've ever spent some time on the bench, um, you know what I mean by that. Yeah, it made sense. Everybody out there? Everybody else out there having a good time? <laughs> in the peanut gallery. I'm chilling. I was recording all of it. No, I'm just <laughs> Listening. Yeah, right on, man. Absorbing right on. it. Yeah, I... That was a lot of good stuff. I... Oh yeah, I kind of agree with Shane. Well, absorbing, I guess man. you guys you, you said a lot yeah. just now. You uh, yeah, it's a big. It was have fully put packed. Your time in and your thought into your response here, so that's really, really appreciated. To, I never know, even I never even know who the dude was. I saw his video, but I got more from this response video than I probably would get from watching that dude's video and from Stone's assessment. Do I need to watch the rest of his video? I think I'm good. 
Yeah, no, I, I recommend you follow his video for sure. Now, there's value ma valuable material in there, and it sets the context for what I'm addressing to you. So the, the more you see, even of the second half that I never spoke about, the okay. more that you see of that and then return to my analysis, the more you're going to see where we're taking the turn. Well, here's my problem the with that. Off the path. What you said was that he did a bunch of false presuppositions that you proved false, and then he built a bunch more on those. And I was like, oh, then I'm not any more interested. Like, he's got to unbuild this whole well, thing hey, before. No, man. Hey, I, I'm not God here. I'm not laying it down in, in stone, quote. <laughs> well, you are, I think. You are kind of you see God. So. so, no, really, just I, I do recommend it. it um, I don't know, man. You, you have to see what not is as well as what is in order to learn more about why what is is yeah, Evo's, what is. Evo's approach is, is really respectable, and uh, I would say it's worth giving him yeah. a little time. Yeah, he tries to be objective. He tries to be systematic. He tries okay. to be logical. And there's a lot to, to respect there. It's a, it's a lot of work, man. You know, you have to respect anybody who's willing to lift a finger in general, much less share the results you know, and his thoughts about it and how he got there. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, the um, whole first half you know, of the that video... that is to be exalted. The whole first half of the video is him going through Tesla, like, direct Tesla quotes. And then the second half, even if you disagree with him, he, he uses some pretty cool uh, VR presentation of trying to explain his circuitry and such. So it's it's a pretty interesting watch. Granted, yeah, I haven't watched like, thing yet. Uh, like that is what cool. he views as the electrostatic effect of just pulsing a simple conductor. You know what I mean? Before you even deal with any kind of geometry or length or that kind of thing. Um, just just what he says about that. And like you were mentioning about Steinmetz and his diagrams, I see some interrelation there that I think he's trying to draw. I'm not sure all of it's correct, but um, I think it's good to have it in your pocket just to know that it was spoken. So then final question, why is everyone calling him by his first name like he's a lad and we all know him? Did you guys, is this just, is just this video or did I miss a whole like... Are you talking about young Evo? My boy? My sweet baby <laughs> like, boy? Like who the fuck is Evo, I guess is my question. Well, that's his, right. his nick actually. He refers to himself as Master Evo. And you know, I, and I, I see a cultural interpretational problem here with the term that on one side of the world, say the far eastern side of the world, in the dojo, master. <laughs> you, you know, that's the guy at the top of the chain, right? But over in the western world, like in a Batman scenario, it's young Master Wayne. Master was the title given to people before Mr. There, there's an inherent rank to the term. And I think that's actually the direction he wanted to go with it. You know what I mean? So I, I figured I would. That's an interesting right interpretation. I, I never would have guessed that. Yep. I <laughs> that. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have come to that conclusion on my own. Yeah, I, I never would have. But that is now my that is now my conclusion moving forward. That's canonized. <laughs> yeah, official channel lore. Like, yeah, you guys know Batman. That. Oh shit! No way. Well, no, no, master. Yeah, just like that, man. Master is before Mister, so before you can graduate to a Mister, you no, have no, to no, be no, For, no, no. Forget about all that. His backstory <laughs> is when he was a kid, he was coming home from a show with his parents, and they got killed by a local crime. <laughs> Shut up, he... Master. You're not a Mister. I'm Mister speaking. <laughs> <laughs> you rang. There it is. What was that about the pale moonlight? Is that a Batman reference? Yeah, I just like the sound of it. <laughs> Maybe it was like a 60s Batman before all of our times. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that no, one. it was... Uh, <laughs> Listen, guys, it was you Jack. Know Jack. Yeah, man. Michael it King. was Jack. <laughs> oh, no, I missed that one. Yeah, it's not even a Batman to us. We don't know who that is. I'll see the Keaton one again. You'll, it'll come back to you. It's one, of the Mega Man, one, one of the Mega Man bad guys, right? Batman? <laughs> Did, you ever dance with the devil? Did you ever dance with the devil under the pale moonlight? Who's the main bad guy in BS2, Back in Business? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what was spoofing anymore. Uh, what are you making fun of? Uh, a little, a little ditty called Barbershop 2, Back in Business, starring Queen Latifah. Ice Cube and some other. <laughs> you actually watched a that? little ditty, dude. dude. Wow, <laughs> dude, stop. Like a, 
a heartfelt drama of your childhood, oh, perhaps? Cuts. It's the owner of Nappy Cuts. I can't think of the guy's name. <laughs> oh, Are we racist cuts. now? What they happened were, here? They were getting undercut. No, we're we're talking about plots yeah, of yeah, Nappy Cuts. They have they have oh. goldfish in the floor, and you can <laughs> you can you can have one of the fish pulled out of the floor and fried on the grill for you what? while you're getting a haircut. Join us tomorrow night at 9 Eastern for Trivia Night on Ether Cosmology. We'll, uh, Barbershop we'll 2 Batman Trivia and... Night. That would be a good Barbershop one. Barbershop 2 Back in Business Trivia Night. <laughs> He's going to win. Everyone. <laughs> wait, wait, no. Don't say even, don't even say trivia. Andrew will show up and fucking, we'll all be taking tests and he'll actually be we'll fail and no one, no, <laughs> we'll have any answers. We'll all just be stupid again. Don't. All right, well, I, don't, I don't want to, I don't want to derail. <laughs> Stone's thing with with barbershop too much barbershop. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, yeah, let's let's keep it on the path here. Cool. Keep yeah. So, path. um, anyone else have any final thoughts or questions for Stone about that? Or Stone, is there anything else you want to wrap? Yes, up please. With? Any any questions at all about what I just said? Because that was that was a lot. I'm sure someone wants some clarification in there about something. I, and I if think... not, even then, you know, like uh, Jose, I hear you. But one sec, even if there aren't, um, by all means, review it and hit me up. Later on, any old time, I'm right here. I think the I think the biggest confusion for us laymen is how does the counter space overlap with the ether? You know what I'm saying? Is how is how's the mechanics? Sorry, my phone is going nuts here. Let me turn it off. But um, uh, the the overlapping, because you know, like you said, there's a lot of misconceptions between ether and counter space. But how does you know how does that even work? How do they act independently, so to speak? That well, I think this it's because they are independent phenomena, that one is um, a resultant gradient, if you will, that is a, a force that is ambient in the physical space and affects all things to a very slight degree. This is why I cited the, the jet stream. And what you've got a picture is, is a, a force, let's say pseudo-toroidal in geometry, over top of our topographical plane, affecting large air masses, which are diamagnetic, so that you know you can picture ether going as fast as it goes, kilometers per second. However, you might see the speed of the flux within that field affecting something physical like an air mass that's diamagnetic in a way that it's constantly causing it to accelerate towards its velocity. But because the force is so subtle, the acceleration is so gradual, the air mass goes to other parts of the geometry so quickly that we only see speeds roughly two, 300 miles an hour out of it, if that makes sense. On the other side of the fence, um, when we're talking about counter space, this is, this is non-physical realm that we're talking about. We're, and this is why I talked about opening the door, so to speak, through like an electromagnetic or an electrostatic process where we're talking about where does that energy actually go in time. And what we're seeing that's not in the textbook, what I'm seeing is that even for simple, something as simple as holding out your hand with a basic cylindrical coil, that that axial point inside your fingers going around where the current is, in parallel to your thumb, where the B field is, there is an interaction between physical and non-physical space, as far as I see what's going on here. And that is interaction with those other additional three dimensionalities of, of what we're talking about here. That there's three plus one for us and three more for counter space, so to speak. And, and you know what? It really only has to be represented in one dimensional term because it's non-physical. It, it isn't bound um, to the time parameter like the first three are. And this is how I think we get nonlinear almost responses coming back out of it. This is why the the rising edge of the EMF, the back EMF spike in the decayed field of the B, you know, why it's so fucking steep is because what's coming behind it that's causing it is 
quote unquote unlimited in terms of its energy potential, and there is zero impedance, zero perceivable impedance between counter space and physical space when you're moving in that direction. So I'm I'm seeing the need inherent in the analysis for um, attempts to achieve resonant function based on those rates of flux, and that they are non-symmetrical. I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was you or if it was Dollar that was talking about um, measurements um, with there would be excess measurements that you would attribute to counter space. And I guess uh, for us visual learners, the, 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 the difficulty is, is what you just said, three dimensions in actual space and three dimensions in a different realm or dimension. And trying to pitch, picture that and how, as you say, mentioned it in one, one reality, you could actually re-describe it in one reality. That visual is, is a little bit difficult. I hear what you're saying, but the visual is very, very difficult for me to. If you have some type yeah. of diagram, if you have any it's, diagram. It's why I invoked three. It's why I invoked three in the beginning in the introduction of the concept, because that's easier for the human mind to, to visually, you know, in abstract 3D picture in your mind. That it, and it's, you know, it's a little bit like the ones they draw in the relativity clown circus when they show the 2D plane with the grid on it and they drop a ball in the middle and then there's all this radial sink around the ball. That same kind of aspect in, in planar geometry, you can apply sort of as a dimensional divide between physical and non-physical space. And it really can just be a one-dimensionality on the non-physical side. And we could, say, measure that merely in terms of Q. And the rate at which Q is flowing in and out of physical space, if that makes any sense. Yes, that actually does kind of help. Uh, what would you replace their world lines with? Obviously, we won't do a time world line or in a space world line. What would you do with that analogy to represent counter space world? An integer line, like because it's one dimension. That's what you end up with. And, and that's why I mentioned Q as the metric. And that's really what we're exchanging in between physical and non-physical space is the charge of what's flowing through, for example, the conductor through your fingers along the axial point to produce that interaction, to open that door, to create the exchange. Does that make sense? Integers with Q. Kind of. I'll, I'll look it up. You know, I'll, I'll do my diligence in doing my... Uh, <laughs> well, geez, I hope you find something on it. <laughs> if, if, you may, if I may, you, you have your DMs are open if I have any questions, sir. I'm sure that's but, goes with us. Of course. I, I knew it, but I figured I'd ask anyway. Thank you, though. Ooh, should we appoint an ether cause secretary, though, for those EDMs that we don't want to take? That's a great <laughs> idea. We do have a janitor. <laughs> yeah, but that's not, I mean, Is secretary the... seems something like we could use. <laughs> I, I don't know. I've been exploiting the janitor to take care of messages. Yeah, we've got that's a lot of work true. for the janitor. We put a lot of work on him. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to save us a couple bucks here, boys. No, you're not You're not <laughs> taking away janitor hours from all of us. We, we need his we need his time. Oh, this is so how we justify a larger budget, Alan. <laughs> I was thinking about the PNL. That's what's up. <laughs> all right, all right, boys. We need some expansion here. We got a budget to spend, and if we don't spend all the money, we won't get the same amount next year. It's a good point, Stone. I overlooked <laughs> that. So we're here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hire five hundred thousand secretaries. That's right. You gotta think like the government. That if they, of course, they're they're going to need pens to write everything down. So there's going to be ten thousand dollars per pen. I think we can make this work. Best. <laughs> and, and shipping. <laughs> well, so hold on, real quick. So let's. Uh, I, I don't know. Is there any other final thoughts, questions? You guys had a nice dialogue there. Um, great questions and great answers. Uh, I guess we're good, good for now. Cool. I I mean, I don't have any final, I don't really have any other questions. I feel like um, I need to honestly go back through and take notes because there was, Xavier asked a perfect question there. I, I love that dis, that discussion about the um, the relationship there and your answer was really illuminating. So I... Thank you. 
and I like how when you went to your explanation, you kind of <clears throat> went to the larger picture of the Earth and the Earth weather systems because it kind of shows the inherent force in motion that's just everywhere in our in our existence, like in our realm. I think that's a pretty good example of something going on in, you know, that's more than just a material medium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So hopefully that's a proper interpretation of kind of why you went there with that. Uh, so yeah, anyone else, any final thoughts or questions for Stone about uh, the energy stuff and what we addressed of Master Evo's video or what he addressed? Thanks for listening, gang. And again, Evo, if you want to reach out, please do. We're, we'd be happy to open a dialogue. Stone, you can hit up Stone on Telegram or just respond here in the comments. Take care, everybody. Much love. Cool. My stream is done.